All right, so it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Nock Vampir Ansar. Uh, Nock is currently a professor at Iowa State University. She got a PhD at Caltech. Um, uh, she was one year after me. No, um, before. No, before, sorry, sorry, before you. Yeah, correct, 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 correct before you. Um, and, uh, uh, and then uh, after Caltech, uh, she spent a lot of time at uh, this company called the Newtonomy, which was then acquired by another company, and now it's acquired. It's, 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 a, it's a long story, but uh, she was uh, a very important figure there. I think uh, it was one of the like, five people who actually knew how the car worked. <laughs> you know, that actually had, had a sense of how things actually worked. And, um, and then now, yes, yeah, so now recently she's coming back to academia. And uh, now looking at the pictures here, it seems like she's still interested in self-driving cars and uh, formal methods. Uh, please knock. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you for the, the very nice intro and especially the, the nice song. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I guess it's afternoon in Zurich now, and uh, it's, it's just the morning here. Uh, it's a little unfortunate I cannot be there in person. Uh, Switzerland is one of my favorite places, and I always <laughs> try to find an opportunity to be there physically. Um, so today, as, as Andrea mentioned, I'll, I'll talk about uh, autonomous systems, uh, particularly focusing on how to ensure that the system will work uh, correctly as, as we want it to. And um, to give a sense of what autonomous systems are, uh, let me give you a very specific example of autonomous vehicles like what are shown uh, in these uh, pictures. Um, they are all designed to operate in urban environment. Um, so, oops. So why, why is it uh, challenging to, to design uh, this kind of system? Uh, I would say there are sort of three big uh, challenges involved. Uh, first of all, uh, they need to operate in uncertain and unstructured uh, environment. Uh, that means we have absolutely no control over the environment uh, at all. And because of this, there are pretty much infinite number of uh, possible scenarios that the car has to be able to handle. And so it is just impossible to, to, to exhaustive exhaustively test all the scenarios. Uh, the second challenge is the interactions, uh, complex interactions between uh, multiple components. Uh, these are complicated systems. Uh, they consist of multiple components like perception, planning, control, localization, and each of these components also have multiple subcomponents in them. Um, and last but not least, uh, there's a combination of discrete and continuous decision making that, 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 that needs to be done. And uh, again, when these decisions uh, uh, are not uh, interleaved properly, uh, some problems may occur. So let me show you some video. Uh, this is from Alice at the Urban Challenge. Alice was a, a vehicle uh, developed by Caltech. Uh, to participate in this competition. So before the, the race, we actually tested her in, in all sorts of scenarios that we could uh, possibly imagine. Uh, and we were very confident uh, going into the race. Um, and she actually did well in the other two tests, giving us much more uh, confident. But then we ran into this test, and this is uh, the test that involved making left turn across traffic with the uh, right of way. So we don't have the right of way. Uh, the traffic, as you can see, is quite uh, dense. And she needs to find a 10 second gap in the traffic to, uh, to merge uh, left. And you can see that uh, she didn't quite do it right. Uh, instead of going as fast as possible, uh, she went forward, but then had to go back and then slowly uh, go, go forward and, and, and make the turn. And um, um, this is, this behavior actually illustrate uh, all the, the, the three challenges that I mentioned. And in particular, this kind of uh, behavior uh, arises from the unforeseen interactions between three different components that I will uh, mention in, in a little bit. And this interaction only manifests as undesirable behavior under a very specific set of conditions. Uh, so there are three components involved in this case. First of all, we have the path planner. 
uh, the, the responsibility of it is just to generate a path for Alice to follow. And then we have the safety system, which will rapidly decelerate the vehicle when it deviates too much from the path and also get too close to an obstacle. And the last component involved here is the low level steering controller. And in this case, to protect the physical steering unit, uh, we impose the limit on the torque, uh, which means that Alice couldn't uh, uh, turn as fast when the, the speed is low. Um, and so when you look at each of these three functionalities by itself, uh, it, it, it makes uh, perfect sense. Um, and, but when they actually combined uh, together under this very specific uh, scenario where you have uh, merging uh, and tight turn and uh, the, the concrete uh, barrier right after the turn, uh, the undesirable uh, behavior will, will happen. Uh, we did test left turn, uh, we test merging, we tested tight space handling. We also test driving next to the concrete barrier. And in all this, Alice was doing fine. It was just that when all this um, um, uh, specific uh, of this test comes together, is the exact situation we, we never test, uh, the, the exact combination we never test. And in this case, because uh, the turn is very tight, uh, the plan path uh, is also uh, involved the, the, the tight left turn. Um, so because Alice starts from completely stop, uh, she cannot follow the path exactly. So she started deviating. Uh, and then seeing that uh, there's a concrete barrier here, the safety system then start acting to slow down the vehicle. And because the vehicle was slowed down, uh, the, the, the limit on the low level steering uh, is even tighter. So she couldn't turn as much. And because of that, uh, this sort of go in cycle, uh, she couldn't complete the turn and the logic say back up uh, so that she could uh, try the turn again. Um, and, 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 and then she has to slowly go through all these stages of uh, not being able to turn as much, uh, then deviate from the path, seeing the concrete barrier and uh, slow down again and so on. Um, so uh, this sort of illustrate why we cannot exhaustively test and even imagine that a situation like this could even occur and, 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 and cause uh, the, the interaction that we thought that makes sense uh, 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 result in this very bad behavior. So um, to uh, better design the system, uh, uh, we sort of turn into the, the formal methods. And in this case, uh, in formal methods, we have uh, the model of the system. We start with the model of the system. Uh, what it does is that uh, it explains, uh, describes all the possible behavior of the system. So anything that is physically possible for the system should be included in the model. Uh, some of this might not be desirable. So for example, in the case of a vehicle, it could run into other objects. So that is physically possible, even though it's not desirable. Now, on the other side, uh, we have what we call requirements. Uh, this specify the desired behavior. So some of this might not be physically possible. So when we write a requirement, it's just these are what we want the system to do. All right. On the other hand, the model, describe what is physically possible for the system to do. Now, besides that, we might also have some assumptions uh, on the environment, uh, because if we, if we don't have that and uh, assume that we have to handle all the possible situations, uh, we will also have to take care of the case where other objects try to sort of run into us and avoiding collision will just be impossible. Um, so from all these three elements, uh, we will construct uh, the system plus the environment uh, model. This will be the formal mathematical model of the system. Uh, again, describing all the possible uh, behaviors uh, of the system and also the environment. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we also have the formal specifications, which describe uh, what we really want the system to do formally, precisely. And uh, once we have the model and the specification, uh, we could design a controller by hand and then uh, verify formally uh, that 
the combination of the controller and the system plus environment will satisfy the formal specification. Uh, in the case where uh, this is uh, the, the, the spec is satisfied, uh, then we actually get the certificate of, of this as well. Um, on the other hand, if the spec is not satisfied, uh, we will get a counter example and we could use that uh, to sort of modify the controller and try to re-verify the system again. Um, now, I would argue that a more attractive approach uh, is instead of having to design a controller by hand and then go through the verification uh, process, uh, we could try to automatically synthesize this controller in a way that it is correct by construction. And in this case, if the synthesis is successful, uh, we will get the controller and it is guaranteed that uh, it will that that the combination of controller and system environment will satisfy the specification. Otherwise, it will say that the controller does not exist. And uh, depending on whether you have a complete algorithm for synthesis, uh, if you have a complete algorithm, then th there's no point to try to design a controller anymore because it essentially says that the way you write the spec is not physically possible. Uh, to, to have any controller that satisfy it at all, all right? Um, so let me uh, sort of discuss formal synthesis through this unprotected left turn scenario. Uh, here we have an autonomous vehicle. Uh, this is the green car at the bottom right corner, uh, which we call MA, uh, A for autonomous. Uh, we also have the oncoming vehicle, uh, MH, and so H for human driven. Uh, this is not under our control. Uh, we also have the traffic light, uh, which we call ML, uh, L for the light uh, here. Um, and we also don't have control over this. So in this case, both MH, the human driven car, and ML uh, are considered the environment uh, for the autonomous vehicle. And we can describe the property we want uh, in temporal logic. Um, this is a, a formal mathematical language to precisely describe what we really want the system to do. I will not go into the language in, in, in detail, but you can see that there are uh, part of it that looks like propositional logic that I, I, I think most of you are already familiar with. Uh, here we have this H4, A4, these are called atomic propositions. Uh, what it says, uh, H4 means that the human driven car is in cell C4. All right, and A4 means the autonomous vehicle is in cell C4. So when both of them are in C4, uh, four, that means collision occur. Right? So that's that's what this uh, uh, first uh, conjunct really means. So that means collision happen, uh, and we don't want that. So this is the negation. So we don't want the collision to happen until the autonomous vehicle reach cell C9. All right. Uh, so this is this is just how you could uh, specify this property uh, precisely. Uh, once we write it in temporal logic, there is an automatic uh, process that uh, can translate this into something that a computer could understand. That's a finite uh, automaton. In this case, it's a bookie automaton. All right. Again, I'll, I'll not go into this in detail. So this is the specification side. Now, uh, depending on what you know uh, about the system, uh, you can construct a different model, and that would also lead to different uh, synthesis uh, problem. Um, so first, let me describe uh, the closed system synthesis. This is where we know exactly how each of the agent would behave. All right. So that means that we know exactly that, for example, uh, the human driven car will keep going down. Uh, the light will just keep switching between uh, green and red. Uh, and uh, if we apply on the autonomous vehicle side, if we apply the brake, uh, the vehicle will stay at the same cell. And if we apply the acceleration, it will move to the next cell. Um, so in this case, when you compose all of these uh, models together, uh, what you end up with is a deterministic system meaning that once you pick an action like brake versus acceleration, the next state that includes the state of the autonomous vehicle, uh, the human driven vehicle and the traffic light uh, will be determined uh, exactly. Um, so in this case, we end up with what we call closed system synthesis. 
And the objective here is to compute a policy for the system to satisfy the specification. All right. Um, now, this uh, assumption that we know exactly how uh, the environment would behave is not very realistic. So let me talk a little more about uh, the case where we don't know as much about the environment. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, for example, the, the human driven vehicle uh, may stay in the same cell or move to the next cell. And also the light could stay in green or it might move to, to red. Uh, in this case, uh, we uh, can formulate the reactive synthesis problem. And the objective here is to compute a policy for the system to satisfy the specification, regardless of what the environment would do. All right, so regardless of whether a human driven vehicle uh, decide to stay in the same cells or move to the next cell, uh, the collision cannot happen until uh, the autonomous vehicle actually reach uh, C9. Um, now, uh, the last formulation uh, is where we know a little more about the environment and can put some probability over its transitions. So previously, we only know that the human-driven car might stay in the same cell or it might transition to the next cell. Here, let's say we know a little more that uh, they would stay in the same cell with probability 0.2 and move to the next cell with probability 0.8. Uh, in this case, uh, we could formulate the probabilistic synthesis problem. Uh, where the objective is to compute a policy uh, for the system to maximize the probability of satisfying uh, the specification. Uh, and uh, so this is the, 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 the simple case of probabilistic synthesis, and it can be extended to, to the case where the, the environment is not uh, fully observable. So that would become a partially observable uh, system. And in that case, we might want to instead uh, maximize the average probability or the worst case probability of satisfying the specification. So that is sort of uh, the, the, the common uh, synthesis uh, formulation that, that, that people uh, have uh, looked into. Uh, the limitations of all these form formalisms that I uh, just mentioned is that Autonomous vehicle, autonomous systems in general, typically has many requirements and uh, they may not have equal importance. For example, uh, it's much more preferable to avoid collision uh, and violate the turn signal rule uh, if really needed. For example, if an object just show up and you have two options, uh, whether to wait uh, until you trigger the turn signal, wait for some number of seconds according to the traffic rule before swerving, uh, uh, and, and that will be too late, uh, versus just swerve right now and uh, uh, violate the, the, the turn signal rules. I'm pretty sure most people would pick the latter. Um, but the previous uh, formalisms uh, for synthesis that I mentioned do not uh, differentiate all this importance. They treat all the rules as one single unit and either you satisfy all of them or you violate uh, some of them. Uh, um, and it doesn't matter which one, they will be treated exactly equally. Um, so to sort of account for um, an importance uh, of, of, of the rules and, 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 and multiple rules, uh, we introduce uh, the, the concept of prioritized safety specification. Uh, it has four elements, uh, the, uh, the set of atomic proposition pi, and also uh, the set of formula. Uh, this is uh, LTL formula, the, the one that I just showed in the left turn example. Um, so these two are pretty much the same as uh, the, the previous formalisms. Uh, what we add more in this case are two mechanisms uh, to specify the importance of the rules. The first mechanism is the hierarchy. So first of all, uh, we organize the rules uh, into hierarchy. Uh, what, what we mean here is that uh, the, the, the first level uh, in this hierarchy is where the most important rules are. And then the later level will be less and less important. And the last level will be uh, the, the least important rules. Uh, 
uh, Andrea has this uh, example of uh, the, the, the first level might be safety to humans, the second level might be the safety for properties, then all the way to the last level that concerned with the comfort of the passenger, right? And also each level uh, may contain several rules. Uh, so they are sort of of the same uh, priority, uh, but we could also have the weights uh, between different rules. All right, um, so that's the, the second mechanism. We have the weight uh, function uh, that applies the, 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 that assigns the weight for violating each of the rules. All right, so those are sort of the two mechanisms that, that we introduced. Um, and uh, we also look at a specific uh, formula. So I mentioned we use LTL, uh, but we don't use the full LTL formula because when we started looking into traffic rules, for example, uh, pretty much all of them are about safety. So you don't really need the full power of LTL to be able to express all the traffic rules. So we consider a, a, a set of or, or a subset of LTL uh, that we name psi F LTL GX formula. Uh, G here uh, stay for uh, stands for globally, uh, which correspond to the always symbol here. Uh, X is the next formula, which means uh, uh, which which is the the, the little X uh, here in, in the formula. Um, I'll not go into the detail of of what uh, the, the, the the syntax of this, but essentially. Uh, what this uh, formula uh, leads to is that uh, its violation is either due to visiting an unsafe state or taking an unsafe transition. So uh, any violation at all could be categorized into one of these uh, categories. And uh, uh, there was some previous work uh, some, some time ago where we actually went through all the DAPA urban challenge rule and uh, we could specify all the rules uh, under uh, this, 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 this formula. We don't really need the, the full LTL formula for this. And I'll explain later why we restrict our attention to only this class of formula only. All right, so now that we know how to specify our uh, requirements or specifications, now we need to define what does it mean for a trajectory uh, to, be, to be unsafe and, and the amount of the unsafety. Um, uh, so as I mentioned that um, the formula that we consider uh, can be violated either due to visiting an unsafe state or making unsafe transition. So we defined the level of unsafety as the sum of the two. Uh, so if we visit an unsafe state, uh, the penalty would be the amount of time that the system is in that unsafe state. Um, and for the unsafe transitions, uh, we count the, the number of times where those transition is happened. And then we could sum them with, 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 with some uh, weight. So this is uh, the, the level of unsafety of uh, a single rule. Now, because we have, the, we have multiple rules and organize them into the hierarchy. So what we do is that for each of the level, uh, we take the weighted sum of the amount of violation for each rule. So this is this is the weight that I mentioned. Uh, this is for one level. And then we organize all these numbers into a vector where each coordinate correspond to the level of unsafety of the rules uh, at that specific level. All right, so this, uh, the first coordinate uh, here in, the, in, in this uh, violation vector uh, correspond to how unsafe it is with respect to uh, the set of rules in the first level in our hierarchy, right? And we have uh, n plus one of these uh, coordinates. Okay, now that we defined uh, the level of unsafety, we defined uh, how we specify our requirements. Now we can formulate uh, the minimum violation planning problem. Uh, we start with dynamical system. So this is a continuous uh, differential equation that we are all familiar with, x dot equal f of x and u. Uh, we have uh, the, the, the set of goal states, which we mark as b. Um, and then we have the prioritized safety specification. And the problem here is to compute a, a, an optimal trajectory, which we call x star, uh, that start in the initial state such that it ends uh, in a goal state. So that's the first objective. Um, 
And then among all the trajectories that end in a goal state, we want to minimize the level of unsafety uh, with respect to the prioritized safety specification. And um, here uh, we just use the, the, the typical lexicographical order to compare uh, two vectors. So that means that the first coordinate is the most important. Uh, if the first coordinates are not equal, whoever is uh, smaller uh, is uh, safer. And But if they're equal, then we start looking at the second coordinates and so on. All right, so we just use the lexicographical uh, order to, to, to compare um, the, 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 the violation P not B. Now, among all the, 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 the last objective is that among all the trajectories that reach a goal state, and minimize the level of unsafety. Uh, we want to minimize uh, the, the, the amount of time that the trajectory takes. Right? So those are sort of three hierarchical objectives that we, we have uh, for the minimum violation planning problem. Um, and, and solving this problem, there are sort of two uh, challenges. On one hand, we have the continuous uh, complex dynamics to handle. Uh, and on the other hand, we also have pretty complex uh, specification. It's not just avoiding obstacles like in, in the traditional motion planning. Um, so to solve this, we sort of separate uh, these two concerns. Uh, we use uh, uh, RRT star and an RRG uh, algorithm uh, to sort of concretize our space space because originally we have uh, the continuous space and we want to sort of abstract them uh, into a finite uh, space space. Um, and um, the idea here is, so the reason we picked to, to use RRT star and RRG is that it ensures asymptotic optimalities. So that means as you let the algorithm uh, run uh, to, to infinite time, uh, the trajectory that you get will approach uh, the, the optimal one with probability one, All right? And uh, um, you can see in, in, in this video uh, how, how, how fast uh, uh, the RRT star or RRG algorithm uh, could discretize this space space. So uh, we utilize um, RRT star and RRG algorithm. Um, and uh, the solution here uh, to handle the complex specification uh, is that we, we want to avoid constructing finite state automaton. Uh, I mean, the, the finite automaton that represent the, the spec uh, this is what typically people in formal methods would do to, to handle uh, LTL specification. The first step is typically to translate LTL formula into finite automaton. Uh, the problem with this is that the size of this automaton is exponential in the length of the formula. And if you want to generate the deterministic version of the automaton, it will be double exponential. So that could be uh, quite big. So our approach uh, uh, to, to, to make this run in real time is try to uh, bypass this process. And instead we, we deal with the formula directly. Um, and in this case, what we do is we translate the original formula, which is over uh, atomic proposition into a, a simple safety formula without the next operator, uh, but it will be under uh, the, the cross product of atomic propositions. And this procedure is actually very simple. Uh, we replace each atomic proposition with a tuple P and true, and we replace any instance of next P with true and P, all right? Uh, so once we translate the formula, uh, we just construct a, a finite transition system, like a crypt crypt structure, uh, just like what, what RRT star does. Uh, we, we sample the states and determine its connections exactly like, like how RRT star and RRG is doing it. Now, the main difference is how we compute the weight of the transition. Uh, instead of using the, the length or the, 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 the duration of this transition, we want the weight of the transition to correspond to the amount of unsafety that we defined earlier. Um, so in this case, what we do is we, we first construct uh, the corresponding physical transition uh, between these states uh, and look at the, so we start from time zero uh, and, 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 and reach the, the next state at time t. Uh, we go through this transition and find out where the label change along this transition. What I mean by the label is that 
the actual physical x, y, theta value in this case is not as important as what it satisfies. For example, whether the car is within the lane, uh, whether collision actually happened, uh, whether the turn signal is on. So uh, I call this property uh, the labels, uh, which sort of abstract the, the state into something that we actually care about. Uh, so um, um, we sort of go over this transition and then determine uh, where the label actually changed. So where the properties uh, of the state change along the transition. So let's say there are two points here where the property change. So we start with uh, uh, the label L0, but at time T1, uh, the label change to L1 and time T2, it changed to L2. Right? So we mark the time where, where the label actually change. And then what we do is um, we consider the consecutive labels. Uh, we start with L0 and L1 and see whether the change in this label uh, correspond to uh, the satisfaction of the formula. Uh, if this change uh, satisfy the formula, then there is no penalty. Uh, and if it correspond to visiting an unsafe state, we penalize it by the duration uh, that we are in, 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 in L0. Uh, and if it corresponds to taking an unsafe transition, uh, we would penalize it by one, All right? So essentially what we do is once we find out all the uh, uh, points along the transitions where the label change, we sort of go through each, con uh, each consecutive ones to see uh, how it violates uh, or whether it violates uh, our uh, specification or not, and then assign the weights uh, accordingly. So uh, in summary, the algorithm looks like the follow looks like following. Uh, so we start with the initial state, uh, no uh, transitions, uh, no goal states. Uh, we sample the next states, and then for each of the uh, nearest neighbors, um, we try to uh, connect uh, the existing state uh, to the new state. All right, and then we include also rewiring. Uh, so uh, we try to see whether going through the new states uh, will be better uh, for this state in the neighborhood. Uh, the connect function here could be different depending on whether we want to use RRT star or RRT algorithm. Uh, in the case of RRT star, uh, connection actually happen only if the cost improve. Um, and then this second part is actually rewiring. So that means you need to also remove the previous transition and create the new transition instead. Uh, if we apply RRG, uh, connect simply add a transition between the two states. Um, then if the new state that we sample is part of the goal state, then we update it. Uh, and then we just keep uh, going through this loop until we, we run out of time or we are happy with the solution already. Now, uh, on the theoretical side, uh, we could guarantee a symptotic optimality uh, for the case where uh, Px, so this is part of the, the formula that we look at, is a propositional formula. Uh, in this case, uh, we can show that uh, the solution that we generate uh, from this algorithm uh, converge to the optimal solution with probability one. And Another nice thing is that the complexity, the computational complexity is O n log n, which is exactly the same as in RRT star and RRG. Uh, so we don't anymore have this exponential uh, factor that depends on the length of the formula anymore. So that's sort of the, the theoretical side. Now, uh, let me talk a little bit about on the practical side, how, how do we uh, really, really get this to work and what are the advantages of, of this approach? Um, so I mentioned from the beginning that uh, dynamic environment uh, is one of the, 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 the main challenges. And what it means is that an optimal trajectory that we uh, uh, extract from the algorithm at time t may become the least safe option at time t plus epsilon, even for very small epsilon. And uh, this could happen, for example, when uh, newly detected objects show up. Or another case that actually we saw between MIT and Cornell uh, vehicle at the Urban Challenge is that a vehicle that is initially parked uh, start to move off 
And this actually caused the accident uh, between uh, Cornell and MIT vehicle. As MIT vehicle uh, tried to get back into the lane, which is originally the safest option, but it became the most dangerous option when the Cornell vehicle start to, to move off. So um, as opposed to other formalisms like reactive synthesis or probabilistic synthesis that I mentioned earlier, um, minimum violation planning, because it can run uh, in, in real time online, uh, we can uh, replan in response to this quickly changing environment. So it's better at handling unexpected and unmodel env environment behavior compared to, to other formalisms where we need to sort of specify all the possible behaviors of our system and the environment from the very beginning. And, and in which case we could easily miss this possibility. Uh, another thing that uh, we, we started investigating is that uh, we could define the level of unsafety in a different way. Uh, recall that in this specific work, uh, we consider a very specific definition of level of unsafety, right? We just sum up uh, the amount of time where we are in the unsafe state and the number of unsafe transition. Uh, but we don't need to really limit ourselves to that. Uh, we can actually show that the algorithm uh, also admits other definition uh, with the assumption that the cost can be the cost of a trajectory can be written as a function of the cost on its sub trajectories. And this cost needs to be split invariant, meaning that no matter how you split trajectories into sub trajectories, um, when you uh, compute a cost on the sub trajectories uh, and perform some operation on this, you get exactly the same uh, total violation cost on the original trajectories. Uh, we can even allow different rules to have different definitions of the violation cost. Uh, so one of the most uh, famous uh, cost is the additive one. So we simply, this means that we just, uh, the cost on the trajectory is simply the sum of the cost on the sub trajectories. Uh, another interesting type of cost is what we call a max or min cost. They're the same, you just flip the sign. Uh, so for example, this could be used if you want to maximize the clearance from obstacle. Uh, the problem with this is that uh, depending on the, the cost structure, uh, when we uh, in, 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 in introduce this max cost uh, into our algorithm, it may break the Bellman optimality principle. And in this case, the traditional graph search algorithm like Dijkstra, A star, uh, anything you could uh, imagine, would fail to find an optimal solution uh, because all this uh, assume that Bellman optimality principle holds, meaning that any uh, uh, subpath of any optimal path is also optimal. But once we start introducing the max cost, this property might not hold anymore. So uh, in this case, uh, we recently published another paper uh, that introduced another algorithm, which we call iterated uh, A star uh, to, to, to fix this problem and allow uh, us to still extract an optimal path, even with the, the max cost. So um, let me briefly talk a little bit about the failure of, of this uh, classical graph search algorithm. For example, uh, if we have the robot that start at R and it wants to go to G, right? And it has two objectives. The first objective is to stay as far away from the obstacle here marked in the, the, the color cell, the gray cells, uh, and also uh, the, the, the boundary. So we want to stay as far from the boundary and obstacle as possible. That's the first objective. And among all the paths that satisfy this objective, um, we want to minimize the length. Now, if you run a Dijkstra or a star algorithm, the path you're going to get is this path. All right. But the real optimal path is this one. And what you can see is that up to uh, uh, this point, right, a, a sub path of the optimal path to this point, um, uh, the, the optimal one is actually going this way. All right. So what that means is that uh, the sub path of the optimal path is not any more optimal in this case. And that's why uh, Dijkstra would pick uh, this portion at the beginning uh, before going straight to the goal. But you can see that because 
the, the, the goal is sort of between the obstacle. Um, the optimal uh, cost on the clearance side is at most one, right? You, you, even though here we try to stay further away, it doesn't really matter because in the end, uh, we, we, we need to be very close to the obstacle anyway. So uh, that's, that's the reason why uh, a typical graph search algorithm would fail. Um, and uh, the algorithm that we recently proposed would uh, correctly extract uh, this path. Okay, so uh, this is some of the simulation results. Uh, we consider a case where we have a parked car here in red and the clearance zone uh, that is uh, uh, the polygon around it. Autonomous vehicle is here. Uh, we consider four different rules uh, organized into three levels in the hierarchy. Uh, the, the first level is to avoid collision. Uh, the second level is to remain on the road. And then the third level uh, include two rules, uh, do not stay too close to the, uh, to the parked car and stay within lane. All right, so you can see that fee three and fee four here are sort of conflicting. Uh, in this case, we cannot satisfy both of them at the same time. So the, the vehicle either have an option of breaking the lane rule or has to squeeze into the lane, but then satisfy the clearance rule. And you can see that uh, as we run more and more algorithm, uh, the path gets better. Um, in this case, it decides to uh, squeeze in uh, within the lane. And you can see that the, the cost as we keep running, uh, keep going down as well. Uh, the first two level uh, converges to, to zero very quickly. And then uh, the, as, as we run uh, more and more iterations, uh, the third level also goes down as well. So this is when we use RRT star connection. Um, we, slightly, we get slightly different results uh, when we run RRT algorithm. Uh, the costs uh, are very similar though, uh, and we consider the same rule. In this case, it decide to, to uh, break uh, the lane rules instead. Uh, but but that, that doesn't matter because all we need is that we want the, the total cost to converge to the optimal one. And in this case, either uh, we violate either of the rules. Okay, so to, to summarize, uh, I talked about four uh, different uh, uh, synth controller synthesis problem. Uh, cross system synthesis is when we deal with deterministic system. Um, and the guarantee is that the controller will satisfy the spec. Uh, this one typically run quite fast. So you can run the algorithm offline or online. It's a typical model checking and it can handle a large number of states easily. Um, but the assumption is that the specification has to be satisfiable. That means there exists a trajectory that satisfy uh, the specification. Uh, the second formalism is the probabilistic synthesis. Here, uh, we deal with probabilistic system and the objective is to maximize the probability of satisfying the spec. Uh, typically, the algorithm is quite expensive. So um, the synthesis is typically run offline um, and it relies on an accurate probabilistic model of the environment. Uh, reactive synthesis um, is the case where the system is non-deterministic or uh, adversarial in particular. And uh, the objective is to satisfy the spec for all the possible adversarial actions of the environment. Uh, again, this is typically expensive, so uh, it, it has to be run offline. Um, and the assumption is that we need to have the accurate knowledge of the environment behavior. And we also need the spec to be realizable, meaning that uh, for any movement of the environment, there must exist a trajectory for the system to satisfy the spec. And the last formulation I mentioned is the minimum violation planning. Uh, again, we deal with deterministic systems. And uh, the objective is to minimize the violation of the spec. Uh, as in um, uh, the, 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 the cross system synthesis, we can run this uh, uh, online uh, because it's, it's quite efficient. And we rely on real time replanning to quickly respond to changing environment. All right. Um, so uh, that's sort of uh, the, the summary of what I just talked about. Now, there are sort of a lot of challenges that, that open up uh, after we, we, we look into this synthesis problem. 
uh, formal methods, as I mentioned at the earlier of the, the presentation, uh, it provides a proof that a model of the system satisfy the specification. All right, so it relies on having an accurate model of the system as well as specification. Uh, in the real life, uh, we might not be so lucky to have both components, especially the specifications. Uh, for example, people may say that, okay, for driving, we have the traffic rules. Uh, the, the problem with traffic rules is that it is written uh, in, in English and could be very imprecise. Uh, some of the rules uh, could be interpreted very differently uh, uh, between different people. All right. And also the hierarchy and the priority between rules are not very uh, well understood. Uh, for example, um, uh, this is the, the video, this is the, the collaboration with, with Andrea and, and, and Emilio and, and other people as well, um, is uh, where we try to understand what is the right behavior for uh, park car avoidance. In this case, uh, as in the example I showed earlier, there are sort of two options. Either we try to stay within lane uh, so that we provide enough clearance, or we try to uh, uh, Sorry, the first one is to, to provide enough clearance while uh, having to get out of the lane. The second option is that we try to squeeze in as best as we can, provide as much clearance uh, with respect to the constraint that uh, we, we cannot uh, violate the lane boundary. Um, and then there are also other behaviors uh, between these two extremes as well. And it's not very clear yet uh, what would be the, 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 the right uh, behavior. So that's still an ongoing work. Uh, one of the things we uh, look into is how we uh, use machine, uh, apply machine learning uh, to understand the preferences of, of people to determine. I'm pretty sure that uh, different people will prefer one uh, behavior over the others, right? But in the end, we need to agree on exactly what is the right, what is considered the right behavior. Um, the next challenge I want to mention is that uh, even though we look into applying formal methods at the control uh, and planning uh, uh, portion uh, of the autonomous systems, uh, autonomous system is much more complicated than that, and it also includes like, perception and sensing components. And uh, these days, uh, they rely a lot on machine learning, um, and, and, and typically this doesn't come with any guarantee or, or any model. Uh, so. Um, and not, and not analyzing the, the composition of uh, uh, perception and planning components uh, is still uh, remain a, a, a challenge, right? So we have machine learning based approach here and then the formal methods here. How do we analyze this complete system together? Um, and how about if everything uh, apply machine learning, how do we still understand or reason about this system? Um, for this particular work, uh, we recently submit a paper to, to CDC uh, to sort of understand, um, again, with, with the formal methods, uh, I think people realize that it's very hard to, to apply to the perception side because it's very hard to express precisely what we mean by a, a, a pedestrian, by a car, by a motorcycle or the, and, and, and a cycle. So uh, expressing the model and also specification is, is very challenging uh, when we apply machine learning. Um, so what we try to do instead is to use the metrics that machine learning people are using anyway, like precisions, recall, confusion metrics, uh, to analyze the complete system together with the, the controller that we designed using formal methods and provide some probabilistic guarantee of the overall system. Um, so I would say that some of the, the excitement uh, that I look forward uh, to, 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 to solve is how do we derive a formal specification of autonomous systems? Um, there has been some work on deriving LTL formula from demonstrations, right? But typically what we end up with is a very complex formula that we cannot reason about anyway. 
uh, but we should take note that in this case, it's not just the demonstrations that we have. We also have the textual information from the regulatory requirements. So even though it's not precise, there is already some information there that we shouldn't completely neglect. So we should try to find a way to combine these two sources of information together. Um, uh, the, the second challenge is how do we design and analyze system with uh, machine learning components? So I mentioned that uh, uh, machine learning performance uh, metrics is already well understood and, and people uh, who uh, uh, develop machine learning algorithm uh, always come with some kind of performance metrics. How do we utilize those metrics that already exist uh, to analyze the, the overall system? All right. So, um, Another thing is how do we, I mean, we could imagine using formal methods to guarantee safety, but then for the performance side uh, and making the car more natural and so on, uh, we could consider using machine learning instead. So let me end uh, the talk uh, with a video. This was from Newtonomy a long, long time ago, uh, where we sort of have collected some of this uh, interesting uh, behavior on, on, on the runs uh, that, that, that we saw on the road. Uh, so here you can see that people violate rules almost all the time, right? People cut in front of our car. Uh, you see um, some interesting scenarios like this where we need to change lane because of the illegal parked car. At the same time, there are other people trying to make a U-turn. Uh, here, when we try to overtake this parked car, it started to, to move off. Um, there are also uh, people who kept walking when we, we get the, the green light um, and some uh, other illegal park car near the intersections. Um, so these are something that I would say we see all the time and, and very often in almost every run, uh, there must be some rules that we need to violate because otherwise we cannot go anywhere anyway. All right, so uh, with that, uh, I will stop and I'll be happy to, to answer any questions. Thank you, Nock. Very good talk. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Thank you. No, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, this is a very, very, very interesting. Okay, so essentially you have like a new way of setting those specifications and, uh, uh, and you know, computing this path in, in real time, right? But um, now, one of the issues that we ran into, and I'm sure that you remember, right? So is the sensitivity to small errors, to very small, to arbitrarily small violations in high priority rules, right? Right, right. Is this something that you've given a little bit of thought or? <laughs> right, so one of the things uh, that, that, that came to mind uh, about this is that when we uh, declare uh, the, the, the relations between the two penalty, instead of having you know, this strict uh, uh, comparison, we might say that uh, we allow, let's say the first coordinate to be within epsilon of the other, um, and then we would declare them to be equal, right? And then that, that would take care of all these uh, small uh, violations. Uh, stuff. It will really complicate uh, the craft search algorithm. Uh, we, we still try to look into what, what, what we can do uh, with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the idea is just trying to have some epsilon uh, tolerance before we declare that one uh, path is better than the other. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then, in a sense, you just move the problem to the epsilon, right? So now it's yep. uh, so how they said the now epsilon. We define the epsilon. That's that's true. Mm -hmm. But it would reduce this um, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. sensitivity. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if uh, anybody else. Are there other questions? I have some questions. Go ahead, Abu Fals. 
Uh, okay, thanks for the nice talk. So my first question is regarding this uh, correct by design controller synthesis. Yes. So you mentioned the, instead of using some uh, counterexample based algorithms, you use some algorithms which are both sound and complete. So if the algorithm is not able to find the controller, this means uh, for sure there is no controller for the system. But in the probabilistic uh, synthesis, I'm wondering how this uh, completeness and soundness are, uh, are uh, interpreted because we are dealing with some probabilities uh, and we want to maximize the probability of satisfaction, but always we can design the controller, but with the probability almost to zero, which is not useful. So this, this notation can be used actually for the probabilistic setting that you use? I see, yeah, that, that's, that's a very good point. Uh, so, um, when we deal with a probabilistic system, all we care about is uh, we want to maximize the probability. And so what that means is that whatever we get from synthesis, if let's say this is a complete algorithm, um, what it guarantees is that there does not exist any controller uh, that would ensure higher probability of success. Oh, you mean, you mean we need to a priori fix the probability of satisfaction and just try the algorithms over that probability? So in, in the synthesis side, we try to maximize the probability. We don't fix the probability. Yep, I but know. But we get yep. the result from the synthesis. It will also tell us uh, that this optimal controller has probability P of satisfying the spec. And it guarantees that there is no other controller that has probability more than P of satisfying the specification. Okay, I got it. There is a threshold actually, okay. Yep. Okay, okay. And, and the, the last question, so in the continuous time uh, dynamical systems that you mentioned as one of the challenges. So uh, you said uh, you discretize the state space to build your, for instance, Markov chain in the stochastic setting. So, but before that, the most probably you first discretize the time uh, uh, and, and then discretize the space. So for discretizing the space, I know there are some well-defined approaches to compute the error, but for discretizing the time, is there, a, did you consider this computation of error from continuous time to discrete time? Yeah, so that we have not really uh, considered. Uh, I, I didn't look, that, that there are a lot of work uh, in, in the abstraction uh, community. Um, I, I have not looked a lot of that myself. So. Typically in abstraction, uh, there are two uh, very different approach. Uh, the one with you know, RT and, and RIG, this is more like concretization. Uh, there is also the case where we uh, uh, partition the state space into a finite number of cells. Uh, that is more like an abstraction. And so what it means is that one cell, uh, we treat them as equally. So one cell will be one state uh, in the uh, abstraction versus in concretization, uh, one state uh, in the abstraction is also one state in the original system. Um, and uh, I think- uh, But this I is presented in continuous time setting or discrete time? I think both. So in, in my uh, earlier, like oldest work, probably we look at the discrete time. Yeah, uh, right, but right. there are a lot of work in continuous time as well. Yeah, right, because if this is continuous time, uh, computing those probability of trans, uh, transaction are not easy. So most probably in discrete time, okay. Right, right, right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I also have a question, Nock. Yes. Um, so I, I liked very much your paper about the shortest path with these monoidal costs. Uh -huh. uh, um, and I had a question regarding that one. So the, uh, in the first part of the talk, you were showing these priorities over different uh, rules or, or, or violations. And there you have, in the second part, you have these, part, these uh, uh, monoidal costs. And my question was, did you look at cases in which these monoidal costs are part of an ordered set of costs? Like you have many of them and you have a preference over these costs. Uh... Like uh, not, not maybe just a single monoidal cost, but maybe you have uh, three or four ones. And, uh, and no, you want that, to find that, that's what the work was about. Because if your cost is um, cost monoid, then a classical algorithm would work. Absolutely. Uh, the problem where it did not work is when we take the cross product of this monoid. Exactly, exactly. So uh, uh, my, my question was, did you look at other structure which are not the cross product? 
So, oh, okay, okay. Uh, we have not specifically look at that. Um, so we, yeah. So we we only know that uh, for the product of cosmonoid, this algorithm uh, would 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 help fix the problem. But we we have not look at other other structure where you combine the cost in 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 a different way. Okay. Yeah. So essentially, the idea is that for any uh, uh, substructure of your cost structure that is a monoid, then you could run a Dijkstra for that that part of the substructure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that I understand. Okay, okay, thank you. I uh, wonder maybe in the meanwhile you had you had did, done studies in this direction. That, 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 that's a very good point, actually. I haven't uh, seen examples where where that would be needed uh, yet. So, uh, but that, that's that's a very good point to to expand this to to other kind of structure than 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 the product of the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Doesn't seem so. In case you want to reach out, I think Nock left her contact. Yep. Thank you very much, Nock, for the talk. Good luck Thank for you. the next steps. Anything? Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And, and I'm, I'm very happy to, 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 to be here. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you all for participating. Good see luck. you next week. Good seeing you again. And, uh, say hi to Kostya. <laughs> see you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.